Hi, my name is Natalie Tochi. I am a nurse consultant in child care providers. Today we are going to do a medication administration training. This training discusses oral, topical, and inhalant medications. It's good every three years. Now there are certain medications uh, that you are allowed to give in child care. I always recommend to only administer emergency medications uh, because the more medications that you have, uh, the more responsibility it is. Um, but the medications that are allowed to be given in childcare are oral medications, topical for skin, eyes, ears, and nose, inhalant medications for asthma, and then your pre-measured commercially prepared injectable medications, that's your EpiPen medications. That training is um, good every year. There are reasons why you should not administer medications in your child care. One, if you don't have a doctor's authorization form, then you are not allowed to administer medication. If the paperwork is incomplete or missing a signature, you are not allowed to give the medication. Um, the other reasons um, would be if a parent tries to inappropriately request you to give medication, such as I placed Mary's Tylenol in her backpack, so today if she gets a fever or she seems uncomfortable and cranky, uh, you can administer a dose. Well, no. Um, it is really highly recommended that you only give emergency medications. Any as-needed medications um, should be given at home, and if a child is not feeling well or has a fever or isn't acting appropriately in class where they need one-on-one -on -one attention because they're extremely cranky and sick, then they should be home. Um, other types of medications that are not allowed to be given are rectal medications or injectable medications for non-emergencies, um, medications that require you to take a pulse or a blood pressure before administering. Those kinds of medications um, are for medical professionals and we would not require you to learn uh, something that is out of your realm. Um, that being said, there is a law called the American Disabilities Act that does protect children with special health care needs. So if a medication needs to be administered and you can be trained on uh, how to safely administer the medication, then that child cannot be turned away. So for example, if you have a child with a seizure disorder and they have a medication called diastat, this is a rectal medication um, and must be approved by the state before the child enters your daycare. Therefore, we would need to petition the state. And by petitioning the state, you are getting required forms filled out by the doctor, the parent, and your nurse. Uh, you're having a training done by your nurse and or the parent. And once all of this is done, it is sent over to the state the state sends you a written approval and then the child can begin. The other example would be a diabetic child. A diabetic child has a lot of care um, needed. Um, you may need to learn how to work their diabetic monitor. You need to learn how to give insulin, how to give their emergency medication called glucagon in case their sugar drops very low. You also need to learn how to poke their finger to check their blood sugar. So once all of this training is done, all the paperwork is complete, we send it over to the state and then the state uh, gives you a written approval and only then can the child begin your daycare. Every center must have medication policy. This policy should be signed by the parent. This policy should include things like uh, the types of medications that are allowed in your daycare, whether you give emergency uh, versus non-emergent medication, procedures and forms that are required, um, listing that medications need to be in its original container with pharmacy label. Um, once the uh, policy is signed by the parent, the parent is now aware of what uh, you re recommend or require in your center in order to administer medication. 
there are two kinds of medications. There are your prescription medications and your over-the-counter medications. Your prescription medications are uh, prescribed by a doctor, needs to be picked up at the pharmacist, must be in its original container with pharmacy label, and must have an authorization form uh, written by the doctor and signed by the parent. An over-the-counter medication such as Benadryl can be bought at the pharmacy without a prescription, uh, must be brought in new and unopened, must be FDA approved. When received, the child's name should be placed on the medication, must also have an authorization form filled out by the doctor and signed by the parent. Even though it's over the counter and you can buy it without a prescription, it is still a medication, therefore you need an authorization form. There are brand and generic names of medications. Uh, so for example, the generic name for Benadryl is diphenhydramine. Why you need to know this is because when a doctor orders medication and you're looking at their authorization form, the name on the form must match the name that the parent brings you. So for example, if the parent brings you diphenhydramine, that's what needs to be written on the form. Some doctors will write both names, so therefore you do not need to worry what medication that you have. How do we know a child needs medication in your center? By looking at their health form or physical form, on the second page, the doctor will indicate whether a child has asthma or diabetes or seizures or any other medical pertinent information to help you safely care for the child. In the next slide, you will see a picture of a health form to show you where you can find this information. Another important piece of information is to have emergency contact information. Um, it is important that we have a secondary plan for emergency pickup in case, let's say, a parent works in the city and can't get to you within a half an hour. There should be a secondary plan in order for a child to be picked up within 30 minutes of the emergency. We're now going to talk about required forms. In order to give medication, you must always have a doctor's authorization form. This form must be our State of Connecticut form that says that it is given by child care personnel. You need to be careful because now doctors generate their own forms and if it is not the state form um, and it does not say that it is given by child care personnel, we cannot accept the form. Some doctors have scanned our Connecticut form and it may look a little bit different when it's printed, but it is an acceptable form. On this form, the doctor is going to indicate the medication why they're giving the medication, the dose, uh, the start and end date, and possible side effects that you may see with the medication. The doctor needs to sign and stamp uh, their address and phone number. The parent must sign and fill out their portion of the form. And at the very bottom, whoever is accepting the medication will sign and date that they have accepted the medication. Uh, remember, uh, there are different types of medications, so brand and generic names. So this is where you're going to look to make sure that you have the correct medication. You're looking to make sure that the medication that is written on the form matches the medication that you have on hand. Now, when you give a medication, you need to document that you gave it. So you're going to fill out your MAR. Um, it is important that you fill out the top and bottom portion when you receive the medication. So if it is a prescription medication, you're going to fill out the child's name, date of birth, pharmacy, pharmacy number, and the kind of medication and how often you're going to give it. The bottom part of the form is a great checkoff list. You're checking off that your authorization form is complete. You're checking off that the medication is in its original container. 
that the medication is appropriately labeled, and that the medication is current. Make sure that the medication that is given to you is not expired. You check the expiration date on the actual medication or on the box of the medication. Then you're going to print your name and date. So every time you give a medication, the top and bottom portion will have already been filled out. Therefore, you only need to write the child's uh, medication, uh, the dose, and uh, that it was given appropriately and the child responded appropriately. The other kind of medication forms that are important to have are a topical form. Your topical form is what you uh, give to parents when they want you to administer, let's say, diaper creams um, or chapstick or bug spray or sunscreen. It's for non-medicated creams, non-medicated um, types of lotions. Um, and when they fill out this form, it is important that it's filled out correctly. Um, where it says schedule of medication, it should never say as needed. It needs to be something specific, such as if there's a diaper rash or every diaper change or once a day, twice a day, or if it's a sunscreen, maybe 30 minutes applied after um, before going outside. Um, you also need to make sure that where it says medications can be administered from blank to blank, that that's an actual date, a start date and an end date. I always recommend that all of your forms end on the same date. So you could choose um, the beginning of a school year. So September 1st to sep of 2020 to September 1st of 2021. If your child begins mid-year, let's say they begin in April, it could be April of 2021 uh, to September of 2021. So every new school year, you would start with new forms. This helps you because then your forms don't expire mid-year. Now the parent is signing this form um, and when they sign the form, it indicates that they have tried this cream once before. You should never try a new cream on a child for the very first time um, because we want to watch to make sure they don't have any side effects to the cream. You are then going to sign and uh, date and put a time on the bottom of the form. Now time can be the time that your daycare opens. Let's say you open at 730 and you close at six o'clock there must be a date and time indicated on the form. Now, whatever you administer, you must document. So every time you change a diaper and you put on Desitin, you must document on an MAR. Uh, every time that you apply chapstick, you must document on an MAR. So make it easier for yourself and maybe not have three or four different diaper creams for a child have just one cream, um, but you must always document when you administer um, any type of creams or administer any type of medications. Now this may change, the state may um, allow you to just have a form and not have to document, but as of now, as of 2021, you are required to document everything that you apply on a child. And it's a good thing. It's a way to cover yourself uh, in case you um, happen to have a child that comes into your daycare um, and they don't have a diaper rash, uh, but they leave your daycare with a diaper rash. The parent may say, well, you haven't been applying your cream. Um, and you can pull out your MAR and say, well, actually I have. I applied it each time I uh, changed the child's diaper. It's a way to protect you um, in case something happens. The other types of forms that are required are emergency care plans. So if you have an asthmatic um, that uh, needs medication or an asthmatic that does not need medication, you always need emergency care plan. When you're looking at the health form, the doctor will indicate whether or not a child has asthma. 
unfortunately, they don't always indicate to us whether they need medication and therefore we need to communicate with the parent and the doctor. And if that child needs medication, we uh, will require all forms. If the child does not need asthma medication, um, we still require a care plan. And that care plan is very important because if let's say we don't have medication, but the child is coughing a lot or you notice this having a little bit of trouble breathing, you know that the child has a history of asthma um, and therefore it's important to uh, call the parent. Or if the child is having severe difficulty breathing uh, and you know that the child has a history of asthma and you have no medications, then you'll need to call 911. Uh, the other type of care plan would be your emergency care plan for EpiPens. The doctor would um, fill out a care plan to let you know the steps to follow in case of an emergency. And lastly, the state has an individualized care plan that you can get from the OAC. I like to use this care plan to indicate any medical history that you should be aware of uh, in case something happens. So for example, uh, if they are uh, allergic to peaches, but yet they don't need any medication, we want you to be aware that they shouldn't have peaches uh, during their snack. Um, so we would fill out a care plan and the parent would sign it. The other times that I use this care plan for is for febrile seizures. A febrile seizure is when a child's fever rises very, very quickly and causes the child to have a seizure. Uh, in this instance, we may require them to keep Tylenol or Motrin in the daycare um, to help keep that fever from rising very quickly. Unfortunately, there isn't anything that we're going to really do to help prevent a febrile seizure. If that's going to happen, uh, there is no way of preventing it. Uh, a child may be acting perfectly fine, then lay down uh, during nap time and all of a sudden spikes a high fever and can cause them to have a seizure. Um, you may not notice a change in their behavior right before they have a febrile seizure. Um, but it is important that we have a care plan so that you know they've had this before. Uh, once they've had one febrile seizure, it um, can happen more frequently. Um, but the good news is that it is an early childhood illness and they do tend to grow out of it. When you're storing medications, uh, it's import important to consider a few things. Um, if it is an emergency medication, you're going to keep that medication unlocked where you are able to access it and children cannot reach. If it is a non-emergency medication, um, then that medication will need to be kept locked. Um, this medication can be something like Lotrimin. So Lotrimin is an antifungal cream that's given to babies when they have a yeast infection. So you would think that you're applying this during their diaper changes, and you would think that you were able to keep that cream with all your other diaper creams. Well, it is a medication, and it is a non-emergency medication. Certainly, it's a medication to keep the baby comfortable and to treat that fungal infection, but it's not typically an emergency medication. Therefore, it must be kept locked in a locked uh, box or in a locked cabinet. So how do you safely administer medication? Well, you're always going to look at your authorization form to see what's ordered. You're always going to match what's ordered on your form with what you have. Um, and then when you're about to administer the medication, you're gonna use your five rights. You wanna make sure that you're giving the medication to the right child. So having a picture is very helpful, especially if you're not typically in that classroom. Let's say you're a sub or a floater. You can look at the picture and the child that you're giving the medication. You wanna make sure that you're giving the right medication and that's why you're going to look at your form and the medication that you have on hand. You're gonna make sure that you're giving the right dose. Remember, medications come in different doses and so you wanna make sure that the medication dose that's on your form matches what you have. 
the right route. So if it is a topical cream, obviously it's going to go on uh, the area that you need to administer the cream. Uh, if it is an injectable medication, it's going to go in a muscle. If it's uh, an inhaler, you're going to use your inhaler with an arrow chamber, uh, which we'll, we will discuss uh, further in the video. And then the right time. So most of your emergency medications are given during emergency times. If you have an inhaler, you might need to give it every four to six hours. If you have a medication that has to be given at a specific time, so let's say it is an emergency medication that must be given at 12 o'clock, you have a half an hour before and a half an hour later to be able to give the medication. So you can be given anywhere from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, if it's given before or after, that's considered a medication error. Therefore, you need to uh, call the parent and write uh, and document your error. When you give medication, you need to use your standard precautions. That means washing your hands with soap and water before and after administering medication. Uh, if you don't have soap and water, you can use hand sanitizer until you can get to soap and water, and you're gonna use uh, disposable non-latex gloves. Remember, using gloves does not take place of washing your hands, so when you have gloves on and you remove them, you must wash your hands after. Let's talk about oral medications. In the next slide, you will see a picture of different devices that are used to administer medications. You will see that there is different devices to administer medications. All of these devices must be a calibrated measuring device. Therefore, it could be a dropper, a syringe, a dosing spoon, or a measuring cup. The important thing to remember is that you have the appropriate device to administer the medication. Let's take Benadryl for example. When you're given a bottle of Benadryl, you're given a measuring cup. But let's say you have to give Benadryl to a nine month old. The nine month old may not be able to drink out of the cup. Therefore, you're going to need either a syringe or a dropper. It is the parent's responsibility to bring you the appropriate device. So if you're handed a bottle of Benadryl and it's a baby and you know that they're not gonna be able to drink out of a cup, you must inform the parent to bring you the appropriate device. You can never use a kitchen teaspoon um, when you are administering medication. It will not be the correct dose. Uh, the other safety when giving oral medication is you never want to place medication uh, in an infant bottle or with food. Uh, if you place the medication in a full infant formula bottle and the child only drinks half the bottle, they will not have gotten the full dose. Uh, and that's the same with food. The only time that you could um, place medication in the bottle or with food is if the doctor specifically orders the medication that way on the authorization form. Eye medication. Typically, uh, you will not be doing eye medication because it's typically not for emergency purposes and most eye medications are done once or twice a day. Anything that is done once or twice a day must be given at home. Uh, you should only be giving medication if it is um, emergency or if it is to treat something um, and that you should get approval by your administrator or owner of your daycare before administering the medication. If you do need to administer eye medication, um, one good trick to use, especially if the child closes their eyes very strongly, is to place the dropper on the corner of the eye while their eyes are closed. And when they open the eye, that medication will seep into the eye. I've used this trick on my kids all the time when they were little. Um, that child should also be laying down flat on their back. Nose sprays or medications. 
you more likely will not be doing any nose sprays medications because again, this is for a non-emergency and also uh, most nose sprays are once or twice a day. Uh, you may be asked to do saline for a baby who's very stuffy uh, and babies are nose breathers and so if they're stuffy, they may have a hard time uh, drinking their bottles and if you ever have to do some saline nose sprays, uh, you will lie the baby down on a flat surface and place the spray in one nostril and administer the amount of drops that are required um, by the uh, doctor. Um, and the child will not be happy, the child will scream, the child may start coughing a little bit, um, but this helps loosen up any mucus so that they can breathe better. Eardrops. Eardrops is another medication that you more likely will not have to administer because it is for non-emergency um, and usually is a once or twice a day medication. Uh, if you ever had to administer eardrops, there's a few things that you should be aware of. One, you need to have the child lay down side laying with um, the affected ear facing up and you would administer the amount of drops required and you will have the child continue to lay down for a few minutes in order to let those eardrops fall in. Now, if you have a child that is under three, you're going to pull the earlobe down and back. If you have a child that is over three, you're going to pull the earlobe up and back. And that's just because of the way the ear canal is positioned. Asthma. So asthma is probably one of your biggest emergencies in daycare. Uh, when I look at child health care forms, um, many, many times asthma is checked off. Um, so whenever a child has asthma, we must always have an asthma care plan and we must always communicate with the parent and the doctor to find out if they are required to have a medication in daycare. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory condition of your airways. It causes your airways to tighten and narrow it causes inflammation and swelling in your airways. It can also cause an excess uh, amount of mucus. So what triggers your asthma? What causes a child to have asthma? There are a few different reasons. Uh, one are allergies. So this is um, when it is springtime and you are having seasonal allergies and it causes you to have a runny nose and a cough that can trigger your asthma. The most common one is viral induced asthma. That means that every time that you develop a cold or a cough, it can trigger your asthma. Uh, for older children, they can get something called exercise induced asthma. So that means that anytime they have gym or they're doing a strenuous activity, that can cause their um, asthma to flare up. And therefore, they would be required to take their uh, medication before doing that strenuous activity. Uh, if anyone's smoking in the house, that can cause an asthma attack, strong odors. So I always use an example of me being in an elevator with somebody with a very strong perfume. Uh, I don't have asthma, but that many times makes me want to have a cough and have difficulty breathing. So if you can imagine what an asthmatic feels like, um, that can trigger an asthma flare-up. Um, and then lastly, um, when it's winter time and it's very cold out and it's very dry, just stepping outside into that dry, cold air can cause an asthma attack. So what are the signs and symptoms that you're looking for? Well, you're looking for coughing. You're looking, and the coughing is usually a very dry cough. You're looking for wheezing, which is a high-pitched sound that you can hear when they're breathing. You can either hear it possibly from just across the room or you may need a stethoscope to be able to hear it. Um, they can be short of breath, um, have inability to speak a complete sentence. 
tightness in the chest or labored breathing. Labored breathing means that the child is really struggling to catch a breath. When you're looking at their stomach, their ribs are moving in and out really fast. Uh, nasal flaring and their lips and nail beds can turn blue and that really means that there could be a, a lack of oxygen. There are different kinds of asthma medications. The one that you're responsible for are rescue medications. That's the medication that you give when they're having an asthma flare-up, when they're having the symptoms of the coughing, the wheezing. Uh, it's usually given every four to six hours as needed. It is, um, for example, things like albuterol, Pro-Air, Ventolin, those are the medications that you will be responsible for. And those are the medications that are very important um, to look at when you get the authorization form because albuterol is usually the generic of most of those medications. And so the doctor may have written for albuterol, but the parent hands you Pro-Air. So it is important that the medication on that form matches the medication that you have on hand. The other type of medication is your daily medications. Those are your maintenance medications. Those are usually prescribed uh, during the season where their asthma flares up the most. It helps prevent them from having major asthma flare-ups. Uh, it's usually a once or twice a day medication, which means it needs to be given at home. Examples of these medications are something like Flovent or Qvar. Now, special considerations when somebody has asthma. Communication with the parent is critical. So if a child in the morning receives a dose of their inhaler at 7 a.m., they're dropped off at 8 a.m., and you notice that they at 8.30 they start coughing or wheezing and having trouble breathing, it is important that you know they've received medication earlier. Um, because the medication is given every four to six hours. Uh, if they start wheezing or coughing or having trouble breathing before the four to six hours are up, then there could be something more serious going on or the medication may not be working and they may need to see a doctor. So daily communication is important. Parents should tell you when they gave the last dose and you should tell them when you gave your last dose. There are different devices. Um, the devices that you uh, might need to be familiar with is an inhaler with a spacer. That's usually for children, let's say two and up. Usually two-year-olds can use an inhaler and spacer. A baby may need to use a nebulizer. Uh, and a nebulizer is a machine that compresses air into uh, the cup of the medication to allow the liquid medication to come out as a steam. Uh, the inhaler with the spacer um, is a little bit easier to give. It's quicker uh, because when you're using a nebulizer that can take up to 15 minutes to complete whereas the inhaler is just a few minutes. Uh, we do recommend a spacer for children because that lets them have the full effect of the medication. Now let's look at how to administer an inhaler with a spacer. Your inhaler comes like this. It must come in its original box with pharmacy label. You will also have an arrow chamber. This is a great device because it allows the child to get the full effect of the medication. You're going to remove the cap of your inhaler. You're going to place your inhaler at the end of your spacer. And before you administer the inhaler, you must always shake the inhaler, place the mask on the child's face, press down, and let the child breathe for a count of 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, remove from the child's face and let them breathe normal for a few seconds. Usually the order is two puffs every four to six hours. That was one puff. You're going to repeat the process over again. Place the mask around the child's face, press the canister, let them breathe 
for a count of 10 seconds, and then you're done. Now, the medicine can make a child hyper. It could make them shaky. It can make them sometimes even nauseous and sometimes have them uh, throw up. But most children who are used to this medication will not affect them um, and you won't see a reaction. But for some who are new to a medication like this, can be very hyper and unfortunately a lot of times since it's given every four to six hours it seems like that middle dose always falls around nap time so if you see a child that it gets a little antsy on their cot doesn't want to fall asleep and they've just had their medicine you'll know that the reason for this is one of the side effects of the medication now, if you need to administer a nebulizer to a baby because let's say they're too young to have an inhaler um, with a spacer, um, you will be given a nebulizer. And this is an example of one nebulizer. Um, there are some out there that are much smaller, um, but this is a piece of equipment that if we have nebulizer medication in your daycare, you must have a nebulizer. Uh, if the state arrives and sees the medication but does not see the machine, you're going to get cited because the question will be is what if you have to give this medicine, how are you going to give it if you don't have a machine? So this machine can be a little bit costly um, and usually the parent only has one. Um, so it can be brought back and forth although I really don't recommend it. I recommend that it stays at the school um, because if they do forget the medication or they forget the machine, that child cannot remain in class um, because if the state arrives and sees that we have an asthmatic with no medicine or no nebulizer, you're going to get cited. Um, some of the larger daycares have actually purchased their own nebulizer to have on site so that if the parent does forget their nebulizer, we do have a backup. And what I usually recommend is that you just label it uh, property of and the name of your school. The one thing that does absolutely need to remain in your daycare is the cup and the tubing. This is child specific. This cannot be shared with any other child. Um, the one end of the tubing goes to the machine. The other end goes to the cup. You will open up the cup and the medication comes in little vials that you will squirt right into the cup. Close the cup and you can either place the mask over the child's face, which they tend to hate, or just hold it in place. Uh, the child must be upright when they're having their medication. They cannot be laying down because if the tubing or the mask is in not an upright position, that medication will not come out. Uh, it can take about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and the way you know that it's finished is that you will no longer see steam coming out of the cup. Uh, when the medicine is done, when you're done with your treatment, you need to wash the cup and the mask with some soapy water, rinse really well, and then let it air dry. You do not want to use a paper towel to dry it because any sediment from that paper towel will get into the cup. And then the next time the child has a treatment, they will inhale that sediment. So when do you call 911? You call 911 when the symptoms are worsening. Uh, if the child has had their treatment and 15, 20 minutes later, they are still struggling to catch air. You're looking at them and their chest is moving in and out really fast. Their coloring doesn't look good. They are breathing much faster. Uh, that's a 911 call. You will call 911 if a child is having an asthma attack and they have no medicine in your daycare. You will call 911 if a child is having a seizure or loses consciousness. Remember, when somebody is having trouble breathing, they're having a lack of oxygen. So a lack of oxygen can cause a seizure and could cause them to lose consciousness and can actually cause them to stop breathing as well. 
Um, if the child has received their medication and they seem to have improved within 15, 20 minutes, they're breathing a little bit better, but the child doesn't seem right to you, I would call the parent um, because it's possible that uh, maybe their medicine is not fully working or, you know, if the child is acting ill and needs more one-on-one -on -one care, uh, then the child needs to be home with the parent. So how to uh, return and dispose medications. Um, please keep track of the medication expiration dates and form expiration dates. The parent should replace any medication and, me and medication forms prior to them expiring. Therefore, it's important to check your expirations on a monthly basis to give that parent enough notice that their medication is expiring so that they can replace the medication. If the parent has left your center and you have called them to let them know that they have medication uh, still at your classroom, they have up to seven days to pick up that medicine. If after seven days they don't pick up the medication, it can be disposed. You will need to write on your MAR that parent was called and medication disposed on such and such a date. This is the end of your medication training. You are now required to take a test. Please give your completed test to your office administrator for me to grade and get your results back. If you get more than five wrong, you're going to be required to re-watch the video and retake the test. Once you have passed the test, a certificate will be sent to you or to your administrator and also the curriculum. If you prefer to have a Spanish version of the curriculum, please let me know. Also, if there are any questions regarding anything that you have viewed today, please contact me at your school or center and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Have a great day.